Well, thanks to Don Evans. The last time I saw you was at the Texas Business Hall of Fame, where I think you're honored practically every year because you do something every year to merit it. Uh, I want to say, before we say anything else, General, that I think your book is excellent. Thank you. Uh, it's thorough. It's candid. I hope you all will buy it because uh, it's well worth your time. Our work here is done. <laughs> yes, I think so. Now, General, as I read this book, uh, of course, you've been involved in every trauma in the decade that you write about, 1999 to 2009. And I can't help asking this. It's obvious that you're a good Irish Catholic boy, right. born on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> My birthday's the day after that. Now, what is an older boy like you doing mixed up in things like the National Security <laughs> Agency and uh, all kinds of other trouble? And uh, the first question, of course, is from the news today. Harold T. Martin. How did he wind up working for Booz Allen, who wound up working yeah. for the National Security Agency? And, and what's going to come of all this? So let's, let's start with, with the last question first. And, and, and work, what's an older boy doing? To, OK. Right. So, so the whole story today about a contractor who had information that he should not have had at home, um, first of all, I'm giving you a fact-free answer. All right, I know, okay. I know well, none of the details. Well, I'm a journalist, I like that. <laughs> okay, I know none of the details. But by instinct, by instinct, all right, there may be a little less here than meets the eye. As a cautionary tale, all right, whenever a, a, a bombshell bursts with regard to the American intelligence community, uh, a lot of folks write in, in the most, I'm going to use the word extreme language, most colorful language, takes it to the end of the story, possible storyline. My advice is be patient, let the rest of the story evolve, see what's going on here. The New York Times, one of the sources that broke the story, they point out he's not been charged with espionage, and there's no evidence of any ideological kind of son of Edward Snowden um, component here. All right? It's just that he had all this stuff at home he shouldn't have. So let's, let's see where that goes. Now to the older boy question. That's a great question. And, and, and frankly, in fact, the, the president and I have actually talked about elements of this in private moments. When an older boy assumes the responsibilities of the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, he doesn't change his identity. He, he, he doesn't reduce his personal moral responsibility. But added on to that personal moral responsibility is a responsibility to do things on behalf of the American Republic that no one else is asked to do. CIA operates in a space that no one else in the US government is asked to do, is allowed to do. And so when you accept the responsibility of being director, you're, you're taking on this additional task. It, it doesn't negate your personal moral responsibility. You, you, you don't reject that. But you've also taken on a broader responsibility for the defense of the nation. I used to get, I, I, I tell a story in the book that the phone would ring in the middle of the night and I would know what, what it would be about. And literally, Lee, before I would pick up the phone, I would say, okay, remember Hayden, Whatever you decide, you're going to live with for the rest of your life. But that was not an invitation to be conservative. That was an invitation to think it through, because you realize that if you were too conservative on too many decisions and something terrible happened, you'd have to live with that for the rest of your life, too. And so, so I, I actually found the fit to be comfortable. I, I didn't have to betray who I was or, or who I was brought up to be in order to be the director of the Central Intelligence Agency of a God-fearing American Republic. Well, one thing that meant a lot to you, I think, and you say so in your book, uh, is the fine classical Catholic education you had in yeah. high school and at Duquesne University. Uh, SMU has a fine classical education, too, I think, at Denman College. And philosophy, theology, Latin, uh, these things stood you in good stead, wouldn't you say? It did, and I have a line in the book that the, the, the more senior I got, the less I relied on any peculiar professional expertise, and the more I relied on the things I learned in Catholic grade school and I learned from my mom and dad. And I, I really mean that. And when, when, I, when I personalize that for, for military officers and they ask me to come talk about career development and so on, I say, you know, you, you get to a certain point in your career by doing things right. 
I mean, it's about, it's about efficiency. But you get to the 0506 level, the lieutenant colonel, colonel level, you don't get to go any further by just doing things right. That, that's expected. You're judged on doing the right things. And, and, and that's a different kind of responsibility. And, and frankly, not everyone makes the transition. I don't, I don't mean they do the wrong things or, or evil things. I just simply mean they, they, they don't realize it's not about being efficient anymore. It's about broader questions that aren't about narrow technical expertise. It's about values and philosophy and history. And you've got to place yourself in that context. Well, I think you said that you don't really have much use for books on management and leadership. <laughs> uh, I happen to agree with you about that. Uh, would you say that leaders are born, not made? Um, you know, leaders can get better. Uh, training is always good. Self-awareness is always good. So I, so I, I wouldn't throw the, all of that out. But, but, but I, I do mention in the book, you know, I never, I never was able to finish a management text. You know, at some point, about a third of the way through, maybe half, it was, you've already said this, and frankly, I think I understood that the first time you said it, and I don't need to, to do it again. The reason you feel that way, I think, is most of them are really magazine articles uh, <laughs> padded out to become and a book. Not like your book. Your pages. book is absolutely chock a block full of very interesting things, including stellar wind. Let's talk about that. that. That was a big project of yours at the National Security Agency. It deals with metadata and right. all the things that Edward Snow is all in a dither about in Moscow. Yeah. Tell us about this program. So, so right after 9-11, I mean right after, I mean this is the afternoon of 9-11, I, I, I started adjusting the, the dials at NSA fully within my authorities, all right? It, it, I won't take you through the, the fine print of all of this, but it has to do with minimization of U.S. identities and reporting. Fundamentally, I gave my workforce instructions for communications entering or leaving the United States from Afghanistan, right, err on the side of revealing information rather than protecting U.S. privacy, Full, fully within my authorities. But, you know, remember the day, remember the circumstances, remember where the enemy headquarters was. And so I dutifully informed the Congress. I told the House Intelligence Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee. I said, hey, I'll come down and explain it to you. Senate guy said no. The House people said, yeah, come on down. And I told George Tenet, who was the DCI at the time. Head of so, the CIA. Yeah, right, but yeah. also head of yeah, all, all American intelligence. intelligence. Yes, that's right. So as George tells the story, he goes into the morning meeting with the president and the vice president, and he begins the presentation with all the things he's doing, all right, all getting America back into this game, telling the president. And he said, oh, yeah, one more thing. Mike Hayden's going to jail. <laughs> all right. And the way George tells the story, the vice president says, tell him not to worry, we'll bail him out. All right. <laughs> and then George explains what it was I was doing. And then the president asks, is there anything more he could be doing? So, so George comes back to Langley, and he calls me up. He says, Mike. I was in with the president, and you're going to jail. And, 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 is there anything more you could be doing? And I, I candidly say, he said, George, not within my current authorities. And the little pause on the phone, he says, not exactly the question I asked you. Yeah. Can you be doing anything more? The implication being, with a change in your authorities. And I said, I'll get back to you. Now, everyone, Lee, everyone agreed that we had been too light. We had been late to need simply because of the structure within which we were working. Nobody had to be lazy, weak, or corrupt, all right? We had, we had not been good enough in detecting the one kind of terrorist communication that should have been our highest priority. Terrorist communications, one end of which was in the United States. And so I met with my legal and my operational team, and I said, all right, blank slate. What could we do operationally that would give us a higher probability of detecting those communications? They came up with, with actually three different approaches. And so I told George, and then a few days later, he had me in front of the president, and we explained it to the president. And the president determined, based upon his advice from the attorney general, that he had the legal authority as commander-in-chief to change the structure, the legal structure, within which 
I was working. And what it permitted you to do, and <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong here, is uh, you get a number from outside the country that looks suspicious. Uh, there's some communications between that number and people in the United States, some of them in the Midwest, some in the Northeast, right. you seem to think. What you wanted to do was identify that number uh, without going through a judge and a lot of rigmarole right. immediately. Yeah. And, and begin to look no, into it. Is that it? This and is and the about person, pace. the identity of the yeah. person was concealed unless you really yeah. needed to know. So, so the most controversial aspect of the program shows up in the Snowden revelations as the 215 program. Now, let, let, me, let me pause here, all right? Just kind of stop the tape here and, 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 and say, this is, this is five years into the Obama administration, right? Although President Obama Ran on so that's 13 years, or right. 12 ran, years ran, after ran on a ticket. I'm going to change all this stuff. Once he was briefed on this, he kept this program. All right? So this is not something that President Bush decided to do. Under President Bush, we actually put it under some legal authority beyond his commander-in-chief authority. We got Congress to buy in, and President Obama endorsed it. Fundamentally, what the program allowed us to do was to fundamentally get your phone bills. All right, do not think we're putting alligator clips on your, on your phone line, all right? This is going to the companies and getting records they kept for their own purposes so they could charge you. And we and said, give them to advertisers. Right, right, and we said, you know, uh, we want all that. And we put it into a database, and you know, I'm not making light of this. This was trillions of phone records. But we never touched it until, like you described, so we roll up a safe house in Yemen, let's say, all right? And um, our, our Yemeni allies grab somebody, and he's got pocket litter. It's our description for stuff that kind of identifies him. As, this is a very bad man. And he's got a cell phone. Whoa, didn't see that cell phone before. And so what, what this program allowed us to do was to go to that admittedly ocean of American phone events and say, hey, anybody in here talk to this number we just found in Yemen? And if a number in the Bronx said, well, uh, yeah, actually, I talked to him once a month, we then got to say, well, who do you talk to? That's it. I'm done. I am done explaining this program to you. That's all it did. All right? And we, we, actually, we actually decided that this was the best combination of being effective, terrorist communications coming into the United States, and the least intrusive on American privacy. By the way, I mean, President Bush was listening to the Attorney General about his lawfulness. I doubled down. I went to my lawyers at NSA, who were very conservative when it comes to American privacy, very protective of American privacy. I went to three lawyers serially, not together, independently, one at a time. And all three of them said to me, it is our conclusion that the President, as Commander-in-Chief in the current circumstances, clearly has authority to authorize this. So, so we thought, Lee, that this approach was lawful, effective, and appropriate. We did it. I write about it in the book. I don't make apologies for it. And it continued up until last year, when Congress then explicitly decided we shouldn't do it. So the companies, uh, Microsoft, Yahoo, they, 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 keep, keep, they it keep it now. CIA still, still asks the question. It's just a little, I mean, you understand, if CIA's got it all in one place, it's pretty easy to ask the question. The big change, after all the huffing and puffing about Snowden, was that the, the companies keep it now, but NSA gets to ask the companies. It's a little clumsier. You got to ask multiple companies. And then when you ask the follow-on question, who did you call, you, you have to contact chain across the companies, all right? But fundamentally, Everyone recognizes this was a valuable tool. Well, would you say that Edward Snowden is going to be the Kim Philby of his generation, um, living out his days I, I, in Moscow? I've, I've, I've got to ask this question. I, I was actually in a, in a kind of an event like this, mm -hmm. but, it, but it wasn't in Texas. It was in California, all right? Okay. <laughs> and I was being interviewed at Stanford by Amy Zegard, who's a very good a scholar on American intelligence. And she, she said to me, General, if Edward Snowden were to return to the United States right now, what would be the first thing you would say to him? And I paused only a moment and said, you have the right to remain silent. <laughs> Good. And, and so, Lee, I, I really don't think he's, he's coming home. 
I don't either. Uh, and, and, you know, now there's, you know, um, Oliver Stone just put out a movie, and, and th there's been a bit of a groundswell of pardoning and so on. But l let me just pause here, because I think this is really important. This is not in the book, all right? In, in addition to betraying America's secret, this is, the, this is the single greatest hemorrhaging of legitimate American secrets in the history of the republic, all right? And people argue, yeah, but, he, but he, he, he said this stuff over here, and it created a national conversation. I'm not going to argue that. I could, but I'm not. All I'm going to do is call your attention to the other 98% of the stuff he put out the door, which has nothing to do with your privacy and everything to do with, with how your nation conducts legitimate foreign intelligence. So that's, that's really harmful. But it, go, it goes beyond that. All right? Um, Y'all remember the movie a couple years ago, The Imitation Game, Bletchley Park, Benedict Cumberbatch, Enigma, the, the breaking yeah, of the codes. Right, yeah, sure. breaking of the codes, right? So Bletchley is north of London. And uh, Mr. President John Scarlett, whom you've met, was my counterpart. John is now the president of the Bletchley Foundation, and they are going all out to resurrect Bletchley. And, 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 and uh, Symantec and McAfee have in invested kind of appropriate, and they've resurrected the site. So it's now become a great historical site. So they're going back to the former employees at Bletchley, all right, and saying, hey, we're, we're starting this here program several years ago. Come on, get, we, we want to know your, your, your memories, your stories. If you have any artifacts, we would. So they tracked down the former Bletchley workforce. And in multiple, and Lee, I've, I've checked this out. This is a true story. In multiple occasions, they sent two letters to the same address, to a Mr. and a Mrs. Okay. And when the letters arrived, for the first time, this married couple discovered that their partner had also worked at Bletchley Park. Oh, really? Okay. These people keep the secrets. Edward Snowden betrayed that tribe, all right, who, 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 who were fanatical about keeping legitimate secrets. Any American president in the future who would offer leniency or a pardon to Edward Snowden runs a significant risk of alienating this community on which that president's future will continue to rely. So I come back full circle to where you began. He is going to end his life in Moscow like Kim Philby. He's not coming home. I think so. Well, you became the Deputy uh, Director of National Intelligence, and then the head of the CIA, and marched right into the Enhanced Interrogation <laughs> Program. And uh, you have insisted that it was successful, that it worked, yeah. it worked, it produced results. Uh, you don't have to pay attention to me. Listen to Barack Obama's CIA. Barack Obama's CIA said it worked too. All right, the historical record within the agency is clear. These techniques led to a flow of information otherwise not, not available. Now look, these are very controversial. I get it. And, and, and you can still be a loyal and thoughtful American and be very troubled by this. We were, as the title of the book says, we were playing to the edge. I get that. But here's, here's what I say. I say, any good American can say, I don't want you doing that. I don't think that's the right thing for America to do. And besides, it didn't work. Right? The first half of that, God bless you. All right, we share common values. That's an honest conversation we will have. But the back half, it didn't work. That's a matter of historical record. It worked. We got information we would not otherwise have had. Let me, let me give you an example. So after we get to Abbottabad, after we kill Osama bin Laden, um, there's, a, there's a question and answer period in the White House press room. And I, I can't remember who the spokesman was. It could have been Josh Ernest. I, I don't know. But they were asked the question. Did information from the Enhanced Interrogation Technique Program help lead to Abbottabad and the killing of Osama bin Laden? And the best he could come up with, remember, remember whose spokesman he is, the best he could come up with was there were multiple threads of intelligence that led us there, which is a true statement, and it, which is also not a denial that one of those threads came from, from that. Um, I, in writing the book, one of the, one of the neat things I got to do was to go back through my own documents. I could ask the agency, could I, could I see 
I'm writing about X, Y, or Z. Can I see my documents from X, Y, or Z? And it was like being in grandma's attic. I mean, they, they didn't bring me a narrow file. They, they brought me big boxes. And they would literally back up with a forklift and drop it off. And I got to go through, like I said, like being in grandma's attic. And I, act, I, I briefed President Bush every Thursday morning on covert action and sensitive collection. And I came across a document that was my prep for a briefing to the president in December of 2008, in which my team was laying out the facts that we were tracking and narrowing down on someone named Abu Ahmed al Kuwaiti. He's the courier. He was the courier that ultimately led us, led us to Abbottabad. Now, to be very fair, Leon Panetta, my successor, the team I left behind, added bricks onto that foundation and finally got us to Abbottabad. But if you play it all the way back, one of the sources that led us to Abu Ahmed was, were people who had undergone uh, the EIT program. When Obama became president, you uh, were serving him as head of the CIA for a while, a few weeks. Three weeks. weeks. All right, three weeks. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> three weeks in January, early February, until Valentine's Day or something like that. Uh, but he asked you about Iran. And you said something I had not understood until I read it in your book. And that is that Natanz is not really the key location. Uh, as you said, it's a place where they gather Knowledge and confidence, right. that's one reason some of right. the scientists got knocked off, but really it's near calm in the burrowed into the hills yeah. uh, that uh, that's the place the weapons will be made if they are made. Yeah. Uh, tell us more about so, that, it's very so, interesting. So look, Iran was a problem from hell, all right? I mean, we, we, we talked, my conversations on the Oval with the president, topic number one was terrorism. Topic number two was Iran. There was not a topic number three. I mean, we talked about a bunch of other stuff, but we didn't aggregate around anything that I could say, oh, yeah, that was number three. It was terrorism, and it was Iran. And the president rarely got angry with me, rarely got angry with me. But I remember one session, we got up after talking about Iran, and all I, it was a tough session. All I wanted to do was get out of that room, all right? And unfortunately, the president was between me and the door. <laughs> and he stopped me, he said, Mike, Mike, I don't, want, I don't want ever to be left. Mike, I don't want any future president ever to be left with only two choices. And my summary of the two choices was they get a bomb or we bomb. I want, I want other options. So, Lee, we worked a lot um, on this problem. So now we, we, we migrate into the Obama administration, and I'm there for three weeks. And the first meeting, quite appropriately, first meeting of the new president of his new NSC is about Iran. And I mean, we, we are two minutes into the meeting, and he turns to me, General Hayden, how much en enriched uranium do the Iranians have at Natanz? And, and my re response, Lee, as you read in the book, is, Mr. President, I actually know the answer to that one, and I'm going to give it to you in a minute. But can I give you a different way of thinking about this problem? There isn't an electron or a neutron at Natanz that's ever going to show up in a nuclear weapon. What they're building at Natanz, as you said, Lee, is knowledge and confidence. And they're going to they're go to the HEU, the highly enriched uranium, somewhere else. Now, we all knew at the time the somewhere else was Gum, Fort Al. It was a secret site that we knew about and which President Obama made public about a year later. All right? So my, my point was, the spinning of the centrifuges at Natanz and how much enriched uranium they're recreating wasn't actually a good measure on which we should base decision making. It was how good were they getting at the process. And by the way, I'll fast forward, all right? We now get to a nuclear agreement, which, which I actually say in the book, I don't think we would have bought, but it's not like we had a whole lot of better ideas either. But my problem with the nuclear agreement is that although it takes the enriched uranium away from, from Iran, all right, which is good. Gives it to Russia. Gives it to Russia. To Edward Snowden. Well, no, not directly to Eddie, but <laughs> to Russia. OK, you're but right. It allow, but it allows them to continue to build knowledge and confidence. And in 10 years, when all the restrictions kind of age off, I mean, my summary of the agreement, and remember, I, I try not to be too critical about this, because if this were easy, we'd have fixed it, all right? And it, it lingers. 
I, 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 I make the point that if the Iranians ab abide by the agreement and don't cheat, in 10 years, Iran will be a legitimate, non-sanctioned, industrial strength nuclear state, never more than three weeks away from enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon. Right, let, me, let me end where I began. This is the problem from hell. This is not meant to criticize one administration or another. This is really, really hard. Well, let's talk about another problem from hell, and that's Syria. Uh, back in the Bush administration, somebody showed up from the Middle East, you didn't say who, with some photographs of a nuclear <laughs> reactor in Syria. Uh, El Kahir, is that what it was called? Uh, El Kabar. El Kabar, excuse me. And uh, finally, you took it out, but you took a long time thinking it over and yeah. uh, trying to figure out the best approach. So, so the story here is that someone, a close non-Arab ally in the Middle East, mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, we can't possibly imagine. Actually, actually, there's a cute story behind that. I mean, everyone knows it was Israel. The vice president in his book says it was Israel. So I'm there going through the formal clearance process, and they said to me, General, we really would like you not to mention it was Israel. I go, what? <laughs> everyone knows it was Israel. But I'm smart. I had a bunch of other things I wanted them to concede to me in the clearance process, so I agreed not to mention Israel in the book, all right? But I guess I just mentioned it now. You did, you just mentioned it. <laughs> it's happened. So Meyer Dagon, the head of Mossad, uh, it actually stopped at the White House first with the Israeli National Security Advisor, then Meyer comes out to Langley, and I had a, we had a really close relationship with Meyer and with Mossad, and he lays out all these photos. And these photos are of a facility in the eastern Syrian desert, which we were aware of, all right? And we were looking, but, but, the, but the overhead imagery just wouldn't tell you enough, all right? Uh, the, I mean, it kind of looked like a Walmart warehouse from the overhead imagery. But the Israelis had gotten handheld photos during the construction. You look at those and go, ooh. This looks like that thing in Yongbyon in North Korea. So it was aided by North Korea. And it was. It was aided, aided by the North Koreans. And, and so, um, so we went the next morning to the Oval and laid the photos out again to the president and the vice president. And, uh, and President Bush gave me two instructions. Number one, be sure, Hayden, and keep in mind my agency with regard to nuclear weapons programs along the Euphrates River have been 0 for 1 up to that point. And so the president said, you got to be sure, Mike. And number two, this can't leak. All right? And, and they can't leak. I mean, as soon as it leaked, you would have had the Bashar al-Assad Montessori School and Daycare Center established right next to, to the facility. All right? So two orders. Got to be sure, can't leak. You realize from, and I, I know that, that's exactly right. That was good guidance. But from my point of view, they're like that. How do you be sure? Get more people in the circle. Get some experts on this. Get as many people involved so you have a high confidence judgment. How do you make sure it doesn't leak? Don't tell anybody. <laughs> and so we had to balance those two requirements. At the end of the day, I, I went back to the president to brief him. We actually launched a red team on it. You know, prove to me it's something else. Here's, all the, here's everything we know. Now, put it in a different basket and tell me it's not a nuclear facility, all right? So we really were very, very rigorous on this. I mean, obviously, the president wanted very high confidence that, that this was what we suspected it to be. My red team came back and said, Mr. Director, if this is not a nuclear facility, our highest probability estimate, based upon all the data you have given us, is that it's a fake nuclear facility. Okay. Okay. Well, now, it's interesting. In the book, you said that you feel that you misjudged or you didn't have proper human intelligence, really, on Bashar al-Assad. Right. You said you thought that he was uh, somewhat lacking in confidence, could be indecisive if cornered, could be unpredictable. And actually, he didn't give you much of a response at all, and you were surprised. So here, Lee, here's the debate. So now, all right, it's a nuclear facility. Now, what are you going to do about it? And we, we actually coined a phrase at the agency, 
I mean, I mean, we literally coined it. I mean, we put it on a coin after it was all done that reflected the president's guidance, which was no core, no war. All right? No core, no reactor. This can, whatever we do to make it go away cannot lead to a general conflict in the Middle East. So now we're having a debate with our Israeli friends. How do you go about doing this? And we had an honest difference of views. And fundamentally, my analysts were saying, if you bomb this, he's got to respond. All right? He's got to, he, he cannot, <clears throat> he cannot stand the humiliation of someone, us, the Israelis, blowing up this facility. He's going to respond. He's not, he's not as good as his old man was. Uh, Hafez was really clever, and I mean that in all the good sense of the word. He's going to go stupid on us, and we're going to end up in a war. That was kind of my general consensus from my analysts. Mar Dagon, the Mossad chief, said, Michael, that's not correct. We can do this. We can pull this off. We can destroy it. We can't beat our chest about it. We can't announce it. We've got to let the destruction, we just make it blow up in the night and say nothing. And he will, we will give him enough time to crawl back off the ledge and go back into the room and not jump off and create a war in the Middle East. Ma was right. We were wrong. All right? The Israelis bombed it. Great precision strike. All right? We never said a word about it. They never said a word about it. He gets to act as if nothing important happened. Yeah, somebody blew up some military facility in the desert, but don't worry about it, and, and, and just let it ride. And as a matter of fact, that's what happened. The Israelis destroyed it. It did not lead to a war in the Middle East. And, and Meyer's estimate was actually more accurate than, than what my folks. Now, by, 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 by the way, I mean, don't, don't go binary on me here, OK? These are close calls. Meyer could have been wrong. And we would have ended up with a war in the Middle East. All right? I mean, let's say our estimate would be there's at least one chance in three that if somebody bombs this site, it will lead to a general war. Someone bombs the site, and it doesn't lead to a general war. You realize the estimate still could have been correct, right? OK? There was one chance in three it would have ended up there. But in this case, blessedly, it didn't. Now, there's a sequel to this, all right? Um, keeping it secret is what we've got to do to let Bashar back off the ledge. But as we go forward, you realize who built this thing? The North Koreans. That's the greatest proliferation crime in recorded history. And, and, and now there are great pressures to, well, we've we got to tell people the North Koreans did this. And so at, some, at one point, and we argued about this within the administration, and finally in the spring of the following year, we decided that the need for secrecy had so waned, he's not going to do anything about this, that the need to make public what the North Koreans did determined our course of action. And the president gave us authority in April of 2008 to actually make it, actually make it public, the whole story public, and we did. Well, I can't resist asking you about the current election. You have a wonderful phrase in your book, the curative effect of elections. <laughs> How would you describe the curative effect of this election? And, uh, and I'm interested in the position you've taken. And Mike Morrell, who was an acting CIA director, who's been here at the Bush Center and spoken, has taken the same position. That no, we're not, we're, not, we're not identical. No, that's right. He's, he's very pro-Hillary, and right. you're uh, skeptical about I'm just about... anti-Trump. OK, all right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, well, explain yourself. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, look, um, this, this is a tough choice, all right? And, and, and I, look, Lee, I have freely admitted, in the narrow lane in which I've got some professional expertise, there is no question that, that the, sec the former Secretary of State is going to be better at this than, than the Republican nominee. It, it just is. But I fully recognize, I mean, look, in my own personal suffrage voting, I got a whole bunch of stuff to the right and a whole bunch of stuff to the left to my narrow lane. Which, which causes me to not endorse Secretary Clinton, all right? But I, but I do feel that, here's, here's how I put it. it. It's not quite a cop-out, but it allows me to say without getting too political. Fundamentally, if Mr. Trump governs in any way consistent with the language he has used as a candidate, we all have a lot to worry about. And that's, that's how I leave it. Well, we have some questions from our audience tonight. And this is Jerry Joyner. 
uh, four-star Air Force General, NSA Director, CIA Director. Uh, what keeps you uh, upset most of the time, more than anything else? This audience will understand this better than most audiences I respond to. The defensive backfield of the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> Now, is it true that on a Sunday afternoon you used to drive four and a half hours to Pittsburgh from Washington to see the Steelers play and then drive back again? Not used to. Oh, you still do? You still, okay, all right. Okay, seriously, answer your uh, question. Yeah. Uh, and I'll be very efficient. Okay. Because I get this, what keeps you awake at night. Uh -huh. All right, bear with me here. I'm gonna put a little, little diagram in the ether here between us. This is the vertical axis, horizontal axis. This is how bad it could be. This is how much time you got. Mm -hmm. okay. Down here in the lower, lower corner, not existential bad, but you don't have much time, I put terrorism, all right? You know, this is not going to destroy America as a civilized society. But it could happen because a young man or woman at DFW makes a bad decision at night. So this is urgent, all right? I draw the timeline out three, five, seven years. I got another cloud up here that I'm worried about. Higher, it's, it's, it's more dangerous, but we've got time, a little more time. Here I call, it's a shot group I describe as uh, nations that are ambitious, fragile, and nuclear. North Korea, Pakistan, I throw Iran in the group, and I throw Russia in the group. And then I run the timeline, Lee, out to 10 years, 12 years, and I got something way up here. And it's the Sino-American relationship. Now, this is not predicting war with China. It's just simply saying that getting that relationship right is pass-fail pass fail for American security policy, all right? And again, that's not tomorrow or the day after. We got time, but the effects are really, really important. So that, that's my summary, all right? It depends on how serious. There's a difference between important and urgent, all right? The most urgent down here, the most important up here. Okay, this is from Janet Johnson. What is your best advice for the average person using social media and the internet today? How do we keep our information safe? And you were one of the first people when you were working in San Antonio and running Air right, Intelligence right. to understand right. that cyber is a war zone. Right, that, that's fair. And, and, and America's Air Force was actually on the cutting edge of doing this. And I, I got parachuted into San Antonio in 1996 and my, my staff a little more respectfully than the version I'm going to give you, simply said, welcome, General, sit down, take out a clean sheet of paper, a number two pencil, and write this down. Land, sea, air, space, cyber. It's a domain. We're going to go fight there for America. Mm -hmm. right? But the amazing thing was, and I want to get back to the questions, is uh, at the State Department, at the Department of Homeland Security, they had a, an amazing view uh, that cyber is, I'm, I'm quoting your book, it's a neighborhood, it's a library, it's a marketplace. A pure sentimentality, it seems to me. So, so no, no, to be fair, there, there's, a, there's a great debate. All right? Remember I said land, sea, air, space, cyber. It is a domain. It is a new place. It's a man-made place, but it's a new place. And then you and I have decided to put a lot of things that are valuable to us that we used to keep in our wallet or in our safe or at least in a desk drawer. We've decided to put it up here where it's much, much harder to defend. There, there was a debate. It's, it's gotten a little more muted now, Lee, in the American government. Somebody in my background says, new place, zone of conflict. I got to go defend America up here. You have other parts of the US government who view this to be a global commons, all right? And, and frankly, and, 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 and this was a serious debate. I don't mean to belittle either side, who, who, who said that we were overly militarizing the domain. And you know, I, I, I reject, but I understand the argument. My view is, remember land, sea, air, space, cyber? My view up here, arguing about what it was we were doing in the department, NSA, Department of Defense, up here, and saying that it was a bad thing, that we were militarizing the commons, the, the playground, oh, the marketplace, yeah, this, and this so This happy on, place. Was, was about the same thing as arguing against navies down here. My point of view is, you need good navies from responsible nations mm -hmm. to keep this commons common in the same way that responsible nations need cyber power to keep this commons common too. So I would say that the advice then is to get off social media, wouldn't you? Oh yeah, back to your social media thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, if you, if you can't resist, 
Just assume you're tacking everything up you post on a lamppost outside your home, okay? <laughs> no, I, I mean it. Assume it one way or another, it will ultimately be revealed. And so don't, don't push yourself into a circumstance where you're vulnerable to, to embarrassment. Besides that, I mean, clean up your own act, all right? Good pass, no, I mean it. Good passwords and frankly, two-factor two two authentication. Not just a password, but, but something else that, that makes it much more difficult for someone to assume your identity in this domain and either steal your data, manipulate your data, or reveal your data. What do you mean by two-factor? Um, so that when I bank now, all right, I go on and I plug in my password, all right, but the bank doesn't let me access my account until they send me an additional alphanumeric on my cell phone, which is my cell phone. Mm -hmm. And then I plug in that alphanumeric into it. Now, does that make it impossible for somebody to assume my persona? No, but it makes it much more difficult. Stealing my original password isn't sufficient to get into my account. There are two factors that are required before I can access it. Another, another, another two factor is a password and then a biometric. And so you, you can go to your, your iPhone and, and put your fingerprint into it as another factor of authentication. Mm -hmm. Well, Steve Herman wants to know if you would accept a cabinet post if it were offered to you. I have I've enjoyed every moment of my service in government. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have a question. Do you watch Homeland? I do. You know, I asked Janet Napolitano that question when she was running Homeland Security, and she said she wasn't going to do it. She said, I work on these, kind of these things all day. I don't want to do it. She got home and couldn't resist. Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, I adore it. I can't wait to see what's going to happen to Peter Quinn. Can you? Uh, is he alive? Uh, that, well, yes, <laughs> yes, he was. We're last, we're last seen. So, so. Speaking of Homeland, yes. uh, one of the great things in my post-government life is I get to come to events like this. My wife, Janine, and my brother's with me. So Janine and I are invited to downtown Washington for the premiere of the first episode of the second season of Homeland. Oh, how All wonderful. Right? So we go to the Corcoran Gallery right across from the old executive office building, and we go in there and we watch the first episode. And I, I actually do enjoy Homeland. And so there, there is a party afterwards at which the director and the producer and the cast are there. Mm -hmm. So I walk up to Mandy Patinkin. Yeah, who, who plays, plays Saul, you, who plays Saul. Saul, Saul uh, and I went, Mr. Yeah. Patinkin, hi, I'm Mike Hayden. Small Berenson, that's I, his name. Yeah, I also used to play the director of CIA. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he says, really? Let, and he puts his arm around, let's, let's talk. He wanted to to actually build up his knowledge well, of the Well, of course, and study your mannerisms. Yeah. And, uh, I'll look carefully. When I, when <laughs> the season starts after the first of the year, I think, so I'll look for what he learned from you. Actually, I, I've, I've shared some of my insights with the writers for this season. Oh, good. Well, we can expect a good season then. <laughs> I actually know what's going to happen, but I'm not saying. <laughs> <laughs> Well, General Hayden, thank you so much. And Ken Hirsch, over to you. Thank, thank you. you.